Josh, you ready? Big day. What's the test for? The red seal test. The red seal test. If I were to fail this, I would be unqualified to work. Have you been studying? Yeah. Who doesn't that look pretty? That looks really good, Cass. Practice makes perfect. Okay, Cass. Left. Being a woman in trade, you definitely have to have a really good work ethic. Look how brittle that is, it's just practice and touch it. You always have to, you know, kind of work a little extra harder. Let's put her in. Okay, easy, easy. I don't want to chip the firewall. You always are constantly having to prove yourself, which really puts the fire under me to work harder to show people what you can do. Let's see your questions. Avery quiz you, but he can't read. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here. What's the least aggressive first theory? The oh. what? Well, as of anything, you want to use the least aggressive product that'll work. So, Avery, what she's saying is she wouldn't grab the sledge first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where's the door? On the front of the building, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Mike! There you go, get going. Hurry up, run in there. Good luck, Cassidy. Make us proud. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. see you later. Go with your first impression. Hopefully, uh, she's gonna rise to the occasion and uh, go ace her test. I'm just glad it's her writing the test, not us. We'd be looking for a new job if we were out to do it. <laughs>
Cass, I got a question actually already coming in for you here, so I'll ask it. Um, Cassidy, why did you get into the trades and what made you pick trades over other professions? Um, well, my entire family is in the trades and uh, most of my family is mechanics. Even my mother is a mechanic and my dad is a small engines mechanic. And uh, so I've just grew up in a very handy family and it's always been like kind of trades have always been pushed on all of us kids. So when I got into high school, I was looking for a trade to pursue, especially at a high school, you know, you can make it's you basically get paid to do your training. So, you know it's a really good option, especially like even if you decide to pursue other careers, you know, you always have a profession to fall back on. And um, I just got into auto body and I ended up like absolutely loving it and the creativity that comes with it. And now that I'm in restoration, I just, I don't know, it just seemed like a really good fit for me and I love metal fabrication. So just, yeah, fun Great and on. exciting. Perfect. Um, so that kind of asks this question I had here, but um, another question I have for you here is uh, um, how important uh, are the collision repair, repair technicians or finishers to our society? And I'm actually going to ask Cassidy and Julie to answer that. So I'll leave it a little bit open for both of you guys. Well, I mean, there's cars all over the world. So without collision techs, I mean, everything would be a write-off instead of a fix. So, you know, there's a huge, huge role that plays in collision. Yeah, I'll second that for sure. Um, preserving that historical journey of, of the vehicle itself and keeping them out of the compactor, right? And uh, as well, uh, maintaining the safety of the vehicles on the road. And um, sort of echoing, uh, Cassie, what you said earlier um, about a collision being such a great trait, because um, it really combines that um, creativity, attention to detail uh, with the technical knowledge. And I have definitely uh, known a lot of artists and very creative people in the trades and all, all across the trades. For sure. You have to be very imaginative in some repairs, so. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, you definitely, uh, you definitely can express your creativity in this trade for certain. Mm -hmm. um, hey, Kathy, I got a, a pretty straightforward question here. It just asks, do you like your job? I love my job. I get up every morning and I'm excited to go to work and do what I do. So I can't complain. <laughs> right. Hey, so Cassidy, um, what do you do? Like, what's your day like? What What is your, like, what's your dis daily responsibilities? Um, tell us, just tell us about a daily work, your daily work. Um, well, I'm just what a, well, and I just got my red seal. So I've just went from apprentice to uh, red seal technician, which is exciting, but I start my day. I come in and I'm generally the first one at the shop, especially this year. And uh, yeah, I start up the shop and get everything together. And then um, me and my team, we all do a look around of the cars and create a day plan. Um, I'm generally in metal fabrication right now. So I, you know, I get to pick and choose where I work on the car and cut out the rust and build panels. So that's been super fun, but it's a lot of tedious work at the same time. But so that's generally what I do all day. Um, if we have cars that need help in the bodywork sector, like section that's I'll go to that if I'm done my metal work and then a little bit of paint and primer depending on uh, who we have on staff awesome hey um here's another question for you coming in um it says I know you're more into the older cars uh, American muscle but what's your thoughts on JDM Japanese cars more new but still oldish <laughs> Well, I do really like my American Muscle. To be honest, I'm more into uh, trucks than muscle cars. And um, I actually haven't worked on anything really Japanese or JDM. Like, so I really couldn't tell you. I mean, I think a lot of the cars are super cool and I would love to get into like, you know, drift racing and stuff like that. But uh, it's just not something that I've gotten to quite yet. Yeah, I remember when you were here, a lot of conversation about your uh, pink truck, so. Yeah. 
All my right. truck is not big enough to drive over those cars. <laughs> 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 Um, all right, uh, so I got another coming, question coming in here. Uh, what, what's it like working on a film crew watching as you work? Or what's it like having a, a film crew basically watching you as you work away? Um, at first, I gotta tell you, it was like super nerve wracking, especially because you're so concerned about like what you're doing and like, especially when I first started, I would like stutter a lot and then you have to like redo stuff and like it gets a lot like you have to get used to it because you'll be like let's say I cut out a patch and I'm putting in a new patch well sometimes they'll make you like place the patch there and take it away like six different times so they can get like different angles so it gets a little frustrating and like I'm I personally get pretty flustered sometimes but uh, it's interesting and like i this is my fourth year so it's definitely like gotten better but the first two years it was a lot to adjust to and it's kind of like sometimes they're in the way or sometimes you can't do anything because the film crew isn't there and they need to be filming certain things so um it's kind of like it's really it's really cool to like see all that happen on tv but I think people don't understand how much like work and how many times you have to retake something in order to like get all those different angles and shots that you see on tv to make the show interesting but uh, it's definitely was a lot to adjust to. <laughs> I bet. Really, really unique scenario you're in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got another, another question here for you. So uh, it's just asking what's, is it, uh, what's the biggest downside of your job? Um, or is it film crew following you? <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, because we're like our situation, we only have so many uh, months to build a car for our filming season. So like we're already on a pretty strict deadline. So then when the camera crew postpones, like sometimes we like have to wait for them to be there or, you know, wait for certain people to be there so we can do a task. So then it kind of like slows that down. So we have a lot of like uh, stress around production just with the uh, camera crew kind of you know, slowing down production and already being in a very like high paced shop, which I think is like, yeah, something that mostly I struggle with. And like, other than that, like my job's pretty fun. I don't know. I injured myself a lot though, which is like another downside, but that's okay. I think that's just cause I'm clumsy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a question here is asking, uh, I paint houses as a summer job. Are there any transferable skills? Hmm. Um. I think for sure. I mean, when you're painting houses, you're still paying attention to detail and like a really big thing, especially if you're like becoming a car painter is like attention to color and color match and like application of paint. So it's still like there's transferable skills and you like, you know, I know when you're doing drywall and stuff like that, I did drywall for a little bit and like, you know, make dry like sanding drywall putty and uh making walls straight I mean it's still a transferable skill it's definitely it's definitely different but I think that's like painting houses is still really hard work too so like you're used to the you For know sure. I'll throw in on that one too um I would agree with you that the just being on a construction site or like being in a shop or a trades environment does give you some of that um, transferable skills and that you are aware of the environment and the, um, the way a job runs and also that all that upfront stuff, the occupational safety, the, the work safe, the all, all that piece, you know, it, it really, um, I think any exposure in the trades is a good background of, and just to get you started, and get your foot in the door. 100%. I think, yeah. As soon as you get some trades exper experience, like it's really like adjusting to the work field is like a big part of it. But. Yeah, that muscle memory and everything is there for some skills, right? So you can totally bring that across. Yeah, tool use, you know, whether it's, uh, um, you know, in, in a outdoor environment, indoor, in the shop, you know, that you've used the handheld power tools, you've used some, you know, you've got your collection in your toolbox and 
yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know how to roll out for a job site. You know, the preparation and cleanup probably takes just as long as the job itself. So <laughs> all that work, work ethic piece in there. Absolutely. So I got a few more questions coming in here. So uh, uh, this question is for both of you. Uh, what advice would you give a young woman thinking of entering a trade? Um, personally, I just think the biggest thing about like being a young woman entering the trades is like, you know, there's always going to be like, you know, people that might try to talk you down. It's just keeping your head up and keeping a really good sense of humor and like, you know, developing that kind of like tough skin and like, you know, reflecting some of the other comments. And like at the end of the day, it's just, you know, keep a positive attitude and work your hardest. Perfect. You said it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I would also add, uh, it's a great time to get started and, and get involved that there's a lot of demand out there from industry. There's um, people retiring. There's a lot of ex, um, economic expansion. There's infrastructure jobs and there's um, a lot of, there's like, they project about 70,000 trades jobs opening uh, in the next 10 years in BC and um, I think with um, uh, the lens on the women in trades piece uh, about 5% uh, of all trades people are women and that number really is that's a statistic that has not changed in uh, you know since the 70s basically when women started getting into the trades and um, that, that demand and that support, I think, that's coming from industry is really new and um, it's really fantastic to see. So I think now is really a great time for women to step up and uh, take their place at the tool bench. I totally agree. I've noticed like a lot in uh, like different job opportunities. I have a lot of other uh, girls my age getting into the trades and um, I think now like people are starting to understand that like because we're girls and because we keep better attention to detail and we're generally more organized that like I most of my friends actually haven't had any trouble finding jobs or multiple job offers as well just because you know they're starting to realize that girls are actually have a really good place in these careers. Yeah yeah that's right and um, yeah be, being able to to yeah see that opportunity and, and take it that's that's awesome so yeah totally so Cass I've got a, a question coming in here uh, what makes you proud of your work um to be honest like basically any improvement I make makes me really proud like I know like throughout the years like doing different metal patches and stuff like every time you do something again or something new like I'm always proud of the outcome if there's like improvement from the first time I did it, did it. and like especially lately like um, I actually just hit or I was the first one to hit a hundred billable hours on the car we're working on so like that means like I've made the most progress on my vehicle which is like a really good accomplishment for me like I'm like my productivity in the shop so like I don't know, Every everything I do every day I'm proud of because it's always improvement and it's always getting faster and faster and it always is like an exciting game to play basically. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll segue right into the next question. So what's your favorite car you've done on or off camera? Oh man, there's been so many. I actually think uh, we did Connor's Malibu last year and just all the custom things that we did to it. Like I thought it was really cool and the finished product was just like, wow. And it's so fast and loud. And like, we had to like, it was like our my first time participating in like, you know, widening a body and stuff like that. So it was a lot of first and it was just, yeah, fun to be part of the metal fabrication of such like a unique car. And I also last year we, um, had done a Chevy truck with suicide doors so like that was another thing I really like doing the suicide doors on that truck but I think Connor's car is my favorite right on um so I got a, a apprenticeship question here um so this one kind of probably is going to be for both of you maybe you guys can both give us a little bit of uh 
two-sided perspective here, but what is an apprenticeship and why is it important? Maybe we'll start with you, Cassidy, and then uh, we'll go with Julie. Hey, um, well, an apprenticeship is basically when you first enter a trade and you're uh, still going to schooling and you're not certificate or like certified yet. Um, but being an apprentice is like, you know, super important. It's the beginning of your trade. You get to apprentice under somebody who has experience. So like a mentor who like teaches you. And I don't know, I just think, yeah, it's, it's super important to like go through the apprentice part and like learn your place and all these different cool things and you know you end up apprenticing under so many different people and like getting all these different connections in your field and learning just unique things from everybody yeah absolutely that's a great way to summarize it and i think that's why they call it a journey or a journey person is because mm -hmm. you do you move around from shop to shop and you work with um, different mentors and um that's something i always try and uh reinforced to people is to once you get on your job site to, to find a mentor and, and um, have someone that you can ask questions to and learn from directly. Um, I would say the apprenticeship, I could describe the apprenticeship with what we call like the 80-20 model. So 80% um, of your time you're on the job learning, um, earn while you learn, we call it. Um, you're on the tools, getting paid just like any other job, but then 20% of the time you're in school uh, every year doing that um, block or level training. And so that 80-20 model is um, a system that's sort of been passed down. And um, I think it's a kind of a cycle where you can bring what you've learned in the classroom into the job, into the workplace, and then you take that knowledge and experience that you learned in the uh, shop and you bring it back to your um, influence the experiences that you get in the classroom so it's a pretty dynamic experience uh, um, usually a, an apprenticeship is four years um, and you would start by getting registered uh, with the ITA and so I encourage you to um, shameless plug here call your local regional advisor and get some uh, assistance out in the field if you're not sure what the next steps are if you're in school you can talk to your career counselor and you can get started as a youth or you can get started as an adult in your apprenticeship and um, the advisors are here to help so please reach out well i think you guys have kind of already answered this question a little bit but i just want to pose this question right now is so what what is the benefit of apprenticeship or or working while you learn um i think of like the best part about apprenticeship is like, yeah, you get to make money while you work. So it's not like other um, professions where, you know, you have to spend a few years in school, not getting paid and taking out student loans and different stuff. Whereas like trades apprenticeship programs, you know, you go to school and your school, like you get EI when you're off and then, yeah, you get paid to learn at your job site, which is like a really good opportunity. Mm -hmm. And and to add on to that, I would say the benefits of the Red Seal, um, some people call it the other four-year degree. Um, you know, it's like a bachelor degree, but in the trade. So um, you would uh, get that final certification, your Red Seal. And as I kind of mentioned, it's it's it can be the opening of many doors, not like, oh, I'm finished my journey of my Red Seal. Now it's like, okay, now... I'm getting offers to teach and to train others. Now I'm the mentor. Um, mobility, you can move across Canada and also Canadian certification is very um, coveted uh, in many other countries as well. And um, so being able to progress in your career um, over time, um, being a project manager or moving into um, uh, it can also give you credit in a university degree. So there's like a lot of different things that you can really ladder up on from the trade. So many, many opportunities totally. with that Red Seal. Go for the, uh, keep your eyes on the prize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cass, I got a question here for you. Uh, so someone is asking, if I have a car to bring, it, bring to you, will you be able to do the bodywork on it? 
Yeah, I actually, I see he has, he stated that uh, he has a Ford Fairlane and uh, Lincoln. Um, personally, I take in small side jobs, um, but like mostly like, you know, small dent, small rust repair and cab corners. And I'm not looking for any full restorations because I work a full-time job currently. Oh, so, uh, yeah, I just got a little bit of a plug there for some uh, work. Um, next question I got here is, uh, uh, what's the worst mistake accident you made on a vehicle in terms of body work? Um, actually that was like currently this week. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of like big mistakes and then, and it, it wasn't even a really a big mistake, but I was, uh, given this fender and it was like somebody in the past had already rebuilt and put patches on this fender and it like didn't fit and whatever so anyways I had to like cut out their old rusty patches and put new ones in and then like it ended up being like a two-hour delay because when I put my patch on I made like my body lines didn't line up so I had to like recut and like move my patch down so like that was like my two hour delay of this week, which was like, I don't know, I was pretty flustered with it, but it wasn't really that big of a deal. But like things kind of like that happen every once in a while. It's just like part of the job, part of learning, part of building panels. I think that's what we do in the trades. It's not uh, always doing it right the first time, but learning how to fix the mistakes, right? And uh, it's the same with renovation. You never know what you're gonna find when you peel off that layer. So. You know, you never know what that other person did before you even got there, right? So, <laughs> good mm -hmm. for you. Good yeah. recovery. <laughs> the classic, uh, yeah. one, one learns best from their mistakes, right? Yeah. When we, like, when you restore cars, like, a lot of the cars that we build have already been, like, pre-restored by people, but you find a lot of, like, really interesting fixes from, like, other people that are incorrect and then having to cut them out and fix them, or it's, like, you know, a lot of the stuff we get is like so rusty that you don't even know what the part looks like. So you're kind of just like going off a reference and like trying to make it fit. But Right on. Hey, I got a question in here that's, uh, so has it ever bothered you that there aren't more women in the auto body uh, trade? Um, like currently, I mean, like, I would love there to be more women in the trades, but uh, I work with another girl, Sarah, and I've worked with other girls and actually the shop right beside us has girls too. And up until like, I don't know, I haven't really realized, like, I mean, I know that there's a lack of women in trades, but where in the community that I'm working in, there's actually quite a few girls that I work with and like a lot of my friends. So like, I feel like maybe just where I am, there's a lot more women in trades employed, which is like a really cool thing. But that's great. I'm glad to hear that because it definitely wasn't something that I saw when I started, you know, 25 years ago. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's great, great news to hear. And uh, I think as more women hear about it and there's more opportunity, it's just going to keep growing. And there's a lot of, again, like some of the support that we see out in the field from some of the larger organizations like the automotive. Retailers Association or um, the BC Center for the Women in Trade. Some of these groups are uh, really uh, building uh, strong networks kind of in the background. And so you can meet other tradeswomen. So even if maybe you don't see one on your job, like you said, some of the shops beside you, or maybe some of the other sub trades that come on, maybe they've got uh, a new woman starting with them. And so you uh, start to meet people regionally in, you know, in your area. So yeah, it's building of the network. Hey Julia, I'm actually going to ask you a question here um, while we're on this topic. So, so Julie, uh, maybe you can help describe like what's the difference between a career in uh, uh, collision repair and refinishing, collision refinishing? Sure. Um, yeah, there's about a uh, hundred trades in BC, um, 50 of which are red seal and uh, auto body and collision is one of those. And um, also, um, we're finishing. So auto body and collision technicians would be responsible for uh, repairing and restoring damaged vehicles, um, as well as assessing and estimating the damage and uh, building those repairs and plans, as you were saying. Um, that's what you do at the beginning of every day, right? And um, 
so that would be including everything from those small scratches and, and minor dents to extensive structural damage. Um, think, you know, welding, mechanical, even electrical work. Uh, whereas the automotive uh, refinishing technician would be um, working on the surfaces of the vehicles, um, primarily restoring the finishes. Um, and that would be after the body work has been completed. And, um, you would be including um, removing layers of old coatings, um, mixing and matching paints and colors and preparing the surfaces um, for painting, sanding, filling, and um, spraying. So um, there's the difference in there. And of course, those trades work um, very closely together with one another. Absolutely. Hey, so Cassidy, I'll ask you this question. Uh, which, which one do you prefer? Since, since the trades work so closely together, and you probably get really exposed to both, did you have a preference? Um, well, I like to be honest, I like the collision repair side of things because I find like you can be way more creative and it's just like, I don't know, I like grinding and sparks and, you know, playing with metal, but the refinishing is like really good if you like, um, I don't know, more of a cleaner job. I mean, like it's light sanding and it's a lot more like if you're like perfectionist when you're in the refinishing, cause like basically like that's the last stage. So like when you, you know, put on your paint job, you know, you have to make sure that your base matches up with like the rest of the car and you know, your blend zones and you're clear and everything like that it has to be like, you know, smooth as glass. And I don't know, for me, I just find it funner to do the collision work because you know, it's more, you need more aggressive with it and not so like meticulous and like yeah okay uh, <laughs> so so while i got you with this question here too is uh um describe the most difficult assignment you've been assigned while working on rust valley and how did you overcome it hmm. Uh, to be honest, they throw a lot of difficult jobs at me all the time to, like, Mike loves to do that, just, like, kind of throw me to the wolves, um, but last year was a really big one, like, I hadn't really done, like, a, like, I had, like, made small panels and patches, but last year Mike had me doing, like, you know, full replacement panels, but we were doing this uh, Chevy wagon, and uh, instead of ordering like the proper quarters that fit on that, he wanted different wheel openings. So he ordered a quarter panel that was for a different, uh, still same Chevy make and still wagon, but different. But I ended up like, it had a bunch of different body lines that I had to like cut and like hammer out, make flat, and then like try to put this quarter panel on that wasn't meant to go on that car. So like, I think that one was like probably the hardest to make sure that came out right but it was like completely different curve and everything so I spent more time English like it was just so much more work than it didn't have to be but so I spent a lot of time like English wheeling a panel that already came to me to like make it the right shape to put it on this car but it was fun <laughs> right on <laughs> I could have made the wheel opening and not use that other quarter so it's probably really cool to see like uh you know have that challenge and then overcome it hey like and then that sense of completion yeah it definitely took me a while and i was very upset about mike's choice and panels especially because yeah we're so high deadline too so you know you have everybody and then like because it's a really big deal for like the production to see it it was just yeah it was uh it kind of sucked but it turned out really good so right on <laughs> cool Hey, so I got a question coming in here. Uh, it's uh, on your schooling. So can you describe the process of entering into school all the way through becoming a Red Seal? So what's like start to finish? Um, I feel like Julie, you could probably answer that a little bit better than I did. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. Uh, well, there's, there's, a couple of ways that you can get into a uh, trade and start. One is called direct entry, and that is probably something like Cassidy. You know, I know somebody. My family's in the trades. My, uh, I call it the FBI method. The friends, brothers, and in-laws. You know, just like someone you know, or you got some experience growing up. Um, I know how to use tools or whatever. I can get a direct entry into a trade. I can get started with a job. And at that point, you would 
be asking your employer, can you sponsor me? Can you register me as an apprentice? Usually after being in a place for about three months, they would be, you know, they would know how you work. You've been showing up every day. You've been working hard. You've been, um, whatever, cleaning up, being, you know, dedicated and loyal and all that stuff. Um, they would sign you up and register you as an apprentice with the ITA. Uh, it's uh, not a difficult process. It's just a form, of course. And uh, at that point, you're now an apprentice. And so being an apprentice, you can register for your level one training. And again, that's your 20% in school. So you would, as an apprentice, you'd be going into whatever school, OK College, and you take your whatever it is, your six weeks of school. Um, maybe um, if you've been working and paying in, you can get some employment insurance while you're going to school. That's a unique benefit that the apprentices get. Um, and your employer will work with you to find a time that makes sense for them. Like, um, you know, in some trades, you definitely do not want to be going in the winter because they're super busy because everyone brings in their cars for work or they want to have their house built before Christmas or whatever it is but you find a time that works for your employer and then you just keep repeating that pattern your 80% in the job 20% in the school and then um, pass your exams and, and uh, write your red seal <laughs> I don't know that's sort of the condensed version um, I think some ex experience in there like being assertive on the job site. I know as a young woman, as a young person, as a new person on the job, sometimes it can be difficult to ask for that training on your job um, to get that experience, the full scope of the trade that'll make you a very successful tradesperson. You know, you gotta be a little assertive to make sure you're getting the training you need um, along the way. Yeah, um, I actually, I think, what you just said is really important is the being assertive. Um, my boss all the time tells me I'm like bossy and very like pushy, but as a girl in the trades, like if you aren't very like pushing to have your place and like making sure that you're getting the training and like making sure that they're letting you do new things all the time so you can learn is very important. Otherwise, like sometimes you can get pushed under the rug. So I think like, yeah, definitely having a very strong, strong presence where you are, not so much being pushy, but being known is very important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, another word for pushy or bossy is also assertive, right? So it just depends on your perspective. So <laughs> I think that's really, really important. Um, and uh, yeah, showing, showing that you're dedicated and uh, you want to work hard and just you know, showing your value with your positive attitude and, and you will earn the respect that way. Yeah. Well, For sure. Julie, another way is also like, people can jumpstart their apprenticeship by doing foundation programs as well. Thank you. Yep, you're right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I don't know if you wanted to talk to that, that piece a little bit too, but. Uh... Sure. Yeah, it's a really valuable way to start and some trades, in fact, uh, the foundation is so valuable that you really find it difficult to get a job in that trade without it. Um, I think, you know, like looking at millwright might be one of them. It's kind of hard just to get training randomly without a foundation. So foundation course um, could be six to eight months. It's a full-time paid program. And, um, if you're looking at some of that, you want to call your school or your training provider, uh, find out the what their schedule is because they're highly coveted programs. So if you want to uh, look into a foundation, they're really um, in demand in industry and by um, apprentices. And so you would start in, um, and I, that's how I started. It was a pre-apprenticeship kind of a foundation program uh, because basically all um, all my part-time jobs when I was growing up were typical jobs that a young woman might get, like retail or restaurant or, you know, that kind of thing. And so I didn't really have a lot to offer in a trade. So um, that gave me something 
really valuable to put on my resume and some hands-on experience to offer industry. And eventually I did uh, prove myself and get in my foot in the door and work my way towards some kind of apprenticeship. But after your foundation, that would give you credit for work hours and it would give you um, your technical training equal to level one. And that would allow you to, um, once you get registered with your employer sponsor to um, ladder into year two. So you would get hours, technical training, um, a lot of great uh, hands-on practical experience to um, put towards your, your, your journey in the hole and, and away you go into level two with your employer sponsor. Totally. Thanks, Julie. I hope that answered that question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so two a, pathways. So. Yeah. Uh, so Cassidy, I've got a question coming in here and it's, uh, I'm starting uh, mechanics school this year. Do you have any tips on how to prepare for it? Should I have any prior knowledge about it in advance? Um, to be honest, like, it's always nice having prior experience. Like if you're going to mechanics, even if it's, you know, just knowing how to change a tire and change oil and like your basic vehicle maintenance I mean like really every like from start to finish in the schooling they kind of go over every basis so I feel like even if you don't have a lot of experience like you will get it and then like your experience might come after like in between your years but um, a big thing that I don't think anybody said when like entering the trade of like is like the importance of proper work gear which I wish I would have known like you're on your feet all day so like really like invest in some nice work boots and nice work clothes and like proper like you know make sure that you're wearing proper pants and everything like that so when you're dealing with like different metals and stuff like that you know you don't have things falling into your boots and like yeah just like quality work gear I think is like something I would stress especially going to like something like mechanics it's like things hard on your hands like a nice pair of like well-fitted gloves is also a nice thing I would recommend, but they kind of teach you everything from ground up. Like they'll go through everything in proper. We even like, we had to go through antifreeze for like an entire week in our class. So really like <laughs> they kind of cover all the basics. <laughs> there you get That's the, great. Yeah, good interest. opportunity to get in a, um, a high school class. And um, great point with the safety gear. And again, you know, 25 years ago, there, or even 20 or even 10 years ago, there was not a lot of gear out there for, for women in the trades. And now there's like a lot of different companies that are making yeah. um, gear for women and like proper gloves, safety harnesses, you name it, and boots that actually fit you and uh, all this kind of stuff. So totally invest in that. It, it is worth it. Yeah, I don't think that's something that was something that I didn't learn until like my second year in is the importance of proper work gear. Because yeah, it's all about like the more comfortable you are, especially like work gear can be so uncomfortable. So like, I think it's definitely a big advantage if you have the right stuff and like well fitting gloves are really hard to find, especially if you're a girl. So like, now with some new brands coming out, it's a lot nicer. It's important too to do a good job. You want to be comfortable, right? Mm hmm and safe uh, like you don't want to go with like like you said you got to have like maybe some knee pads in your pants like with that are built in or you know something that's stretchy or or the coveralls or all that stuff it's it's safe sure. and and comfort. a big part of it is like I go to work and I look like a 12 year old boy you know I like personally like me I have like my super long hair that I try to keep nice so like I always put my hair in a super tight wet bun in the morning and then put my backwards hat on and then you know safety glasses earplugs the importance of earplugs oh my goodness um I that was also something I didn't wear in my first few years so like I have some ringing in my one ear so like proper ear protection and like yeah just proper gear in general I mean like it's something that like I strongly recommend to like get all of your like proper gear and well-fitted gear and like yeah, stuff to, that just makes you feel comfortable and safe at work. And it's not about looks, it's just about, you know, functionality. Yeah, and you'll be able to work longer in your career too. For sure. Have, yeah. Totally. So Cassie, do you have any advice or tips to offer the younger female generation, generation wanting to get into the trade field? And, and this probably isn't just for Cassie, Julie, you as well. Any tips or advice? 
Yeah, I just think like it goes back to that like positivity and like really wanting to work and like, yeah, the assertiveness in your work field. I mean, like if you come to work every day with a positive attitude and that want to work, like that'll give you a big, you know, advantage. And I think another thing that people like underplay, especially like once you guys find your mentors, a lot of the time the mentors will be like, oh, that's my not my job or like, oh, whatever. But especially when you're getting paid hourly, I mean, like, I know there's a lot of like small, tedious, like undesirable jobs, but like, it's all part of the career. So if you keep a positive attitude and like, you know, just make sure that you're doing like, even like the bad jobs and trying to keep a positive attitude, I find that that puts you a, like a big way, like just, you know, doing all parts of the job and not really complaining about it and like learning all aspects and especially as you like start out you're going to get a lot of like the lower end jobs that nobody wants but it's kind of all part of the initiation into the trades and like yeah it sucks some days but like it's all part of the job so like yeah and, and a big importance into like keeping your work babe clean also I find is like something that's under stress which will like especially if you're working in a high production shop or ICBC shop, like clean work area and like, yeah, just doing all the jobs that come your way and take it as a good learning experience will get you really far and positive attitude. Like a lot of tradesmen, especially a lot of like people who have been there for a while, like they start getting this, like, you know, chip on their shoulder, like they're better. I find like you lose a lot of respect that way. So it's just, you know, try to do everything as best as you can with the best attitude you can awesome <laughs> it's a good way to sum it up yeah i i was thinking uh before we started uh you know about about this exactly you know and and uh i, I remember one day uh it was probably my very first year you know one of my first jobs and i was outside of course like you said exactly you know young person newest apprentice greenest person on the job lowest on the pole I was outside it was you know pouring down with rain um and I was cleaning up around the job site and it was messy you know I was up to my knees in mud all day long and one of the guys looked at me at the end of the you know last coffee or whatever and he said you know you have been out there all day or whatever you know cleaning up and you still got a smile on your face like <laughs> and I you know I think again it just comes right back to that attitude you're I have a passion to, I have uh, my eyes on a goal. I am focused on getting my, you know, my red seal of whatever it takes to get there. Um, showing up every day, working hard, um, you'll earn the respect. And, and there's always something to learn, even if you're doing that basic job, you know, keeping your, your table clean, keeping your tools sharp. There's, there's always something to do and there's always something to learn. So, yeah, <laughs> very For good sure. point. And I, I would also add just um, that in in general, it's just, it's a really good time to get started and um, to do your research and, and reach out and um, get more information. Um, there's lots of good supports and organizations and resources out there to help you explore the trades um, and to network. Uh, find support and educate yourself um, the trades are very rewarding jobs and they open many doors so um... just to add on to that a little bit I also think it's really important when um, I know like when I found not when I, I first started working at Rust Bros but we get laid off every winter so I went and applied to a different a bunch of different jobs but I think it's really important that like you meet the staff before agreeing to workplaces because you are going to be looking for somebody to apprentice under and I feel like especially if you're trying to like get the best out of your education it's really important to find a place that's going to have not only time to train you but somebody that's going to be you know that's experienced and dedicated and also has a positive you know um, outlook to train you because I know a lot of places like sometimes apprentices get swept under so I think it's really important to like go through the workplace that you're applying to and make sure that you are going to have the right education there. Yeah, absolutely. You got to make sure it's a fit for you and everyone's different. Maybe you want uh, a lot of oversight and uh, someone working there right with you, or maybe you really want a lot of independence and you want to be able to, you know, work on mm -hmm. your own and do your own, you know, jobs. And there's, there's a place for everything. There's a, uh, 
teamwork and independent work. So you got to kind of take that initiative and uh, make sure it's a good match and make sure it's a safe place. And, and if you find afterwards that it's not, you can find a place that's suitable for you and that, that works for you and that's a safe place and a respectful workplace. Totally. Okay. Hey, Cassie, I've got a, a series of questions here uh, aimed at you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one that I have here. Um, so you uh, had completed your Red Seal last year. I remember you sitting in class and preparing for it. Uh, explain how you felt before writing the interprovincial exam or the Red Seal and, and how did you prepare, prepare for it? Um, I was extremely nervous to write the Red Seal test. Um, I haven't always been like the greatest in school, but like, thank goodness trade school. Like, I mean, obviously like I'm super interested in it. So it was a lot easier, but um, I also wrote, like, I still have all the cue cards. Like I have stacks and stacks of cue cards. It's just what that. ended up working for me. And like, I think it's important. Like when, like I have all my cue cards back from year one. So like when I went to go write the red seal test, I still, instead of having to go through all of the books and stuff like that and rewrite out stuff to study. I already had all my study material. So like, I think it's important to keep all that. Cause then when it finally comes down to like the last few weeks, you don't have to like re-go through notes or your book to like retrain yourself. You just have all those cue cards that you can just re-go over. And like, so that's what I, I did. And like a big thing, I think that people don't should, like, on the Red Seal test, I'm not going to lie, the, the questions were not worded fantastic. So like take your time and read through the questions and the answers very carefully. And if you do that, you will pass. Yeah, so I'll st segue from that. So so what are the skills that uh, you learned at uh, Okan College, like in our collision repair to, uh, program? What are the skills that you use probably the most at your job? Oh man, there's so many. Um, School for me, like I like the schooling was very important because like what I learned in school gave me more freedom in my workplace to like refine them. But like personally, I like I don't get to work with aluminum where I work because I do car restoration. So that's not something I get to do. So um, in school, learning about aluminum or, or like aluminum repair and welding, like that's that was like a really big experience for me and like something in the future I would definitely like to like do more of. But you might just um, get an AC Cobra rolling in. Well, yeah, I, I told them that, but, um, and we actually did just get an aluminum welder from uh, Miller, who's one of our sponsorships, so that's great, but uh, anyways, that's like, that's like, aluminum welding is like the only thing that I haven't got to practice that, that we learned a lot of in school, which I'm like very thankful for, otherwise I wouldn't have any of those skills, but uh, as for like, I mean, everything we learn in school, I use basically on a daily like basis it's all like the basic building blocks that you need to like do your job so I don't know I also have a lot of random fun facts from you know all the random stuff that you have to learn that you didn't think you really needed to know some dad jokes that came along with your instructor <laughs> um <laughs> hey, I'm gonna segue right into this question here uh what's the the rarest car you've worked on um to be honest like most of the cars we've done like a lot of like some of them it's not so much rare as undesirable like we haven't really done a whole lot of rare cars uh this year I would love to tell you guys about it but I can't but we are doing some interesting projects this year so like in the future I might be able to answer that question but as of currently we haven't done a whole lot of rare things perfect hey uh somebody's asking about your pink pickup uh so it was a difficult project and do you have it yet um the truck was a difficult project and it was on a very short deadline. Um, I have it here. It's actually parked behind my shop. But since I have taken it home from Rose, it's actually been done for two years now. Um, done in quotations. Uh, when I got it back, it was like a basic build or whatever, just as much as I could do with the shop and finish the paint and body. And it was like a really great experience for me. But um I ended up wanting to do a whole lot of other things to it and like anyways it's pulled apart and it doesn't have tires currently and then my roommate threw a garage or like accidentally like he had leaned a garage door up behind our shop that he was going to use to build a second bay and it kind of like wrapped around the side of my truck so it actually needs a new paint job now because it's uh, a little damaged but I'm planning on having it finished by the end of this year 
Um, I did just get a bunch of new sponsorship parts so I can like finish up the last of the mechanical that I wanted to do. And then it's going to be a, a repaint and maybe a new box side. Right on, perfect. Hey, uh, another question here is, uh, what are some career options once you become a journey person? Um, what do you think? I think we've talked a little bit about it before. Well, once you become a journey, like there's multiple different career paths I think you can take. Um, management is a really good one but I find like I don't find you make as much money doing management as you do actually doing the hands-on work like personally just from what I've seen but uh, it's not so much as like I know an office job when you're in management it's a higher position but uh, like when I was working at Fix Auto I know a lot of people in management were making less than what the techs made so uh, I'll add on to that just in trades in general um, supervisor estimator inspector instructor um, you know those are some kind of standard ones high school shop teacher um, <laughs> and uh, yeah just uh, and also yeah you find a lot of um, trades people with their red seal also are independent business owners Totally, the entrepreneurship is there as well. Thank you. Um, so I got a question here for you, uh, Cassidy, and uh, how did you get the opportunity to work on Rust Valley Restoration Show? Um, I actually get this question all the time and people are kind of surprised by it. Um, so back when I was in high school, I actually still had six months before I was gonna graduate. But um, my parents were reading and I wasn't living at home at the time. I was, I was already living on my own at 16, but my mom had called me and she called me at like, I don't know, it was probably like 11 o'clock at night. And she was reading the newspaper to my dad because that's what they do before bed. And uh, they read this like article that there was this uh, shop starting and it was going to be a TV show and all this different stuff. And my mom had always told me that she wanted me to be... Um, like a woman in trades uh, role model or whatever. She had actually called the Okanagan College two years ago and um, said that I should be your guys, the face of Okanagan College. She's always like really pushed that on me. And then, so she calls me and she was like, you need to go apply. And I had only just done my first year um, through that dual credit program. And then, uh, so anyways, I wrote up a really quick resume and it was not a very good resume either. And looking back on it, like it, a lot of grammatical errors too. <laughs> um, I, uh, I went and I applied there and then it was a series of interviews. I ended up going through like six different interviews with like the people that worked at the shop and the production company and uh, chorus and like they're like the people who like you know calculate like how many viewers or what viewers like and stuff like that and after going through all that they decided that I was going to be a really good fit there and yeah so it was all just a matter of dropping off my application and having the bravery to do that and like I'm really big on like if you see an opportunity go for it because the worst that they can do is say no but I mean if you don't do it you know you might not ever get that chance so as embarrassing or as hard as it might be to like go and like take that big step it's just important to like you know put yourself out there so you can have the opportunity to get a job like this. Cool. Right on. Hey, uh, so Cassie, your time is almost up here, but I just want to, I want to, before I uh, say the thank, my thank yous, uh, I just want to ask you the last question here. So, so Cassie, what are your goals for the future moving forward? Um, to be honest, I'm still deciding what I want to do next. I mean, I'm definitely going to go um, take my last year for refinishing. Um, hopefully maybe this year it might be, end up being next year, just depending on filming. Um, but me and my mom are actually talking about going and doing our motorcycle mechanics together and I did just like I said earlier I picked up some paperwork to register my own shop and get my own GST number because I did just uh, move to a property with a nice big shop so I can be doing work at a home so I think yeah that's my next step is getting my own kind of side business going and then maybe motorcycle mechanics. Cool sounds exciting. Mm hmm Okay, so guys, it's uh, it's uh, come to that hour. That hour has just flown by. I just uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for attending, and I want to thank Julie and uh, Cassidy, both of you. Thank you so much for for joining us and taking time out of your night. Uh, 
um, you know, thank you so much. And everybody that's viewing, thanks for coming and checking this out. Uh, if you guys ever have any questions or whatnot, uh, I believe uh, in the chat, there's all the contact information. So if you have any questions about collision repair or any anything about OC, Okanagan College, don't hesitate to contact us. My contact information should be there and the college's information is there. Don't hesitate and come see us. Uh, and uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing from you guys. And Cassidy, thank you. And Julie, thank you so much. Thanks, it's been a lot of fun. It was my pleasure to join you here tonight. Yeah, thank you very much. It was awesome. Nice seeing you, Danny. <laughs> nice seeing you too. Don't say hi to the crew for me. I will. <laughs>